Hello, everybody, and either welcome or welcome back to my podcast. As always, if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. So I'm sure as you can see from the title of this episode, I am finally getting around to doing the book review that I've been promising you guys for a while now. And that is my book review on The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting a Generation Up for Failure by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. And the reason I wanted to read this book was two separate reasons. First off, this book was obviously massively, massively hyped in the run-up to its release and has gotten a lot of press since then. And I wanted to read it also because I am trying to understand exactly what is going on and where it all went wrong with the youths today. Because obviously there there's something fundamentally different about this younger generation as opposed to previous generations. And I'm not entirely sure where it all went wrong, but something's gone wrong and I'm really trying to figure out where it all went wrong. So to start off, this book starts with the three great untruths that are being taught to kids nowadays. And the first one is what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. The second one is always trust your feelings. And the third one is that life is a battle between good and evil people. Now, obviously, anybody with half a brain knows that those three things are untrue. But they go through it and they go through it kind of chapter by chapter. And the first chapter addresses the first one that what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. And they kind of explain the concept of safetyism and how because of concept creep, it's kind of become this thing that's gotten completely out of control and which safetyism is the idea that like, of course you want to keep your kids safe. And up to a certain point, that is completely a rational, logical thing to do. The problem is that that point has gotten so far beyond anything that is remotely helpful to these kids that it's actually harming them at this point. Like I'm sure everybody has seen the stories about how you can't really let kids out in public by themselves anymore. And I, by, by kids, I mean like not even like early teenagers. Like it's, if you see kids playing alone by themselves in a park, somebody calls child protective services. Or if you see just kids roaming around, you think that there's something wrong when it used to be in my generation and generations before mine, that was a completely normal thing for kids to be doing to kind of learn that idea that, You can be an autonomous human being and kind of be responsible for yourself and start taking the training wheels off so that you can make that transition from being a child to being a fully functioning adult. And now that that is not happening in the way that it used to happen for us, now you have these kids going out into the world where they don't have any experience with being an autonomous adult. So it's starting to create these problems. And The second thing that they address, the always trust your feelings, this touches on the ideas of the microaggressions, the concept of microaggressions, which I'm sure everybody listening to this has heard me talk about this before, but it's the idea that any little thing, like whatever, like even just perceived slights, like not even that somebody meant to insult you or meant to hurt you, all of a sudden it gets blown up into this big to do. And it's viewed as a form of violence, like, like physical violence against somebody. So, but again, it always, it goes back to that. Your feelings are paramount over anything else. And so of course, if your personal feelings are hurt, then this justifies you in acting in, in completely bizarre, insane ways to people who don't understand this concept. And they also touch on the idea of campus disinvitations, which goes into that same microaggression, safe space sort of thing where speech is violent. And if somebody says something that you personally find offensive, that it's somehow violence against your person and that this person needs to be punished in the same ways that like if somebody walked up to you and punched you in the face, like it's it's completely, it's nuts, obviously. But again, that's where these kids are at now. And also in that chapter, there is a discussion about CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the idea of kind of being able to identify within yourself. Like if you are somebody who does suffer from anxiety or you are somebody that gets like panic attacks, somebody who suffers from depression, the idea of identifying that 
when you're starting to like go into an episode, you're starting to spiral, you kind of identify that and you pull yourself out of it before you get too far down into the spiral so that you don't end up in like this very bad negative headspace, which we'll touch on that again a little more later because there is discussion about anxiety and stuff like that that's going on with these kids nowadays. But then the third chapter, which discusses that third great untruth about life being a battle between good and evil people. And this actually reminded me of when I did my book review on Kindly Inquisitors, and then I actually did a separate episode specifically dealing with this concept of viewing life as a struggle between good and evil people. And that's being extrapolated in this way that if somebody disagrees with you personally, that they are an evil person. Now, when you understand that that is how these kids feel, it starts to kind of make sense in your head why they act the way they act. I mean, if you feel like somebody is an inherently evil person, all of a sudden you feel justified in punching someone or you feel justified in doxing them or you feel justified in getting them fired because you feel like you're taking this action against an evil person. Like it's not that you can just conceptualize that people disagree with me and whatever, that's fine. It's that anyone who disagrees with me obviously has to be a fundamentally evil person and therefore has to be punished. So I also discussed the ideas of tribalism, the us versus them, which feeds into that same narrative. And the the idea of identity politics and call out culture, which again, if somebody isn't in your in group, isn't in your little your little clique as far as identity politics goes, if they're not somebody who fits into the in group, all of a sudden they are evil and therefore you can act however it is that you wish to act towards that person. Not saying that's right. Just saying that that's how the mentality is going down. And that's why call out culture happens too. Because again, you feel like you have to re-educate these people or try to change their mind in some way. But obviously call out culture does never change anybody's mind about any damn thing ever in the history of life. It's all about just embarrassing somebody for wrong think. But again, and I'll touch on it again, if you feel like people who disagree with you are evil, then you feel justified in embarrassing these people in public. Like you feel like you're doing something good when you're not because you're not understanding that it's okay for people to have different ideas. The rest of the book goes on to try to discuss how we got to this current moment in the first place. And they have a lot of different reasons because there is more than one reason. And the first one being kind of the polarization of society that we see happening right now. And especially with the whole left-right duopoly cycle thing and how that is causing a lot of anxiety and depression in young people. And it's true. I mean, plenty of studies have been done where there are higher rates of anxiety and depression being reported amongst young people nowadays. And as to why that is, there are a lot of different theories. Some people say that maybe it's just because there is more of a societal acceptance towards reporting that you are having anxiety or depression. Some people blame social media. Some people blame pressures. Some people blame, obviously, the polarization of society. There's a lot of different reasons that people have come up with to try to explain why this phenomenon is happening. But it is happening. And so... Again, when you are somebody who has anxiety, you have depression, you're not, you're, you're leaning into it instead of trying to pull out of it, then all of a sudden, like, these things start to make sense, especially as far as, like, microaggressions and stuff like that. Because if you're that deep into your feels, then, I mean, your feelings become paramount. And it's it's not something that is going to be easily treated. And it's also... One of the things that I think is really a root factor of this whole anxiety and depression is that whole idea that kids nowadays are being thrown just like right into the deep end. Like you don't get that gradual transformation where you kind of slowly kind of get used to being a, 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 an adult. It's all of a sudden you go from being this, this very coddled, bubble wrapped human being and then you go off to college and it's just like, okay, well, here you go. Go figure out life now. Like you're on your own. Have 
have fun figuring out your own schedule and feeding yourself and dealing with interpersonal relationships and have fun just adulting because they have no fucking clue how to do that because they never learned. They were never given a chance to learn how to do anything for themselves. And so then obviously when you're just thrown out there like that, yeah, it's, it's scary. And yeah, I, I could imagine feeling anxiety about it. And I can imagine feeling depressed about it if you're not doing that great of a job at it. But again, it's not necessarily their fault because if you don't know how to do something and then all of a sudden you're expected to do it all by yourself, it, it's, it's a little scary. Like I don't, I don't give Gen Z, iGen, whatever generation you want to call these people, I don't give them as much shit as other people do because they have... They've not been prepared for life in the ways that we were when we were growing up. And really the biggest takeaway from this book for me, this like the biggest light bulb moment was that the idea that these kids, because of this coddling and because they have not had that chance to gradually go from being a child to being an adult, they are mentally younger than we were at those ages. Like, 18, 19, 20 year olds nowadays are where we were at at like 13, 14, and 15. So once you understand that, all of a sudden, so much shit makes sense now. Like the ways that these young people react to things, like we look at it and we're like, at that age, I never would have done this. I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have acted that way. Now try to transpose that. Like if you see an 18 year old doing something and you're like, you're 18 years old, why are you doing this? Now imagine if you would have did that at like 13 or 14 years old, because that's where they're at mentally. And that was just like such a light bulb moment for me. I was like, it all makes sense now. Like, especially as far as like interpersonal relationships and especially sexual relationships, it's like now you're dealing with people who are legally adults, have gone through puberty, obviously have the mental well, they have the physical desire and the physical ability to have sex, but mentally and emotionally, they don't have those abilities just yet because they haven't developed them. And it's like, now Title IX makes sense. The whole Title IX nonsense makes total sense when you realize you're actually not dealing with adults, at least mentally speaking, you're dealing with children. And so... Now running off and tattling and expecting an adult to handle your business for you because that is how these young kids were raised. They were not ever raised to handle anything by themselves. It was always, if something happens to you, you go run and tell an adult. So what do you do? I mean, what do you do now? You run and tell an adult. Like that's what you've been taught to do. They've never been taught to handle shit on their own. So now if a sexual encounter goes bad, it doesn't occur to them to try to handle it interpersonally or with the person that you had this experience with. You go run and tell an adult. That's that's why this was such the light bulb moment. I'm like, I think that is really, I think that is really the key to understanding what is going on with kids nowadays. And they also go on to discuss other things that I've kind of already touched on as far as like Paranoid parenting, the decline in free play. Again, both of these things have contributed to the idea that you have to have an adult around. Like, and if anything bad happens to you, you you have to go appeal to an adult. Like, you can't handle it on your own. So, and they also touch on a topic that I know I've discussed before. And that is, it, it also kind of goes back to the decline in free play and parenting and everything like that. But the schedules that these kids have now, like there is no free time, like none to even develop yourself as a person, let alone develop the ability to know how to interact with other people, how to have friends, how to have romantic relationships, because everything is so, 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 so centered on doing all of the things that will look good on a resume to get you into college. And this also touches on the anxiety and depression thing too, because when everything in your life is about getting this one thing done, like achieving this one goal. And if you don't, or if you fall short in some way, then it's like, I, I, I can get it. I get it. Like I totally understand that mentality, but it's just, it's, it's really, really like 
And when, when you see it, you, you kind of start to understand it. And I kind of feel bad for this generation. Like, I really do. Because they they got lied to a lot, if we're being honest. And they kind of got sold a bill of goods. And another thing that kind of goes along with that is the idea that students going into university now are not being viewed so much as students. They're being viewed as customers. And to be sure, this isn't a concept that started with this particular generation. This has been something that's been going on with colleges for a long time, especially for-profit colleges. But when you look at what the consumer, the student, is looking for in a college experience versus what us older generations were looking for in a college or university experience, it's vastly different. And so universities are changing and adapting to meet their customer demand. Like it's when you start looking at universities, not so much as places of higher learning, but as businesses, again, a lot of this stuff that colleges do nowadays starts to make a lot of sense because you have to cater to your customer. And when you're trying to get all of this money out of somebody, whether it's from the parents, whether it's from grants, whether it's scholarships, whether the kids paying for it themselves, whoever's paying for it, it's a lot of fucking money per kid. So what you want is to make sure that your customer, who happens to be a student, but you're not really viewing them that way anymore, is happy. And so you start seeing colleges and universities cater to the certain ideas and mindsets because like I said it's like think of it less as a university and more as like a resort like when you're going to a resort the owners of the resort want you to be happy they want you to spend money they want you to stay there so they cater to you and that is what universities have become now they've become like resorts like it's less about the educational experience which is what my generation and generations before me were expecting out of a college, like when you were searching for a college, you were looking at, you know, what's the majors, like what's what's the curriculum, how valuable is this degree going to be, like how prestigious is this, how rigorous are these programs, is this going to meet the needs that I have educationally? That's not how universities are being looked at now. Now they're being looked at as, is this going to be a place where I feel safe and comforted and warm and protected? And the educational aspect has taken a bit of a backseat to the experience aspect. And so, I mean, universities have to adapt and they have, and it's not been a very good thing for anybody. It's not been a good thing for the universities. It's not been a good thing for education. It's certainly not been a good thing for these students because I remember when I was young, university was always presented as this thing where like, you're going to go, you're going to leave home and you're going to be an adult and it's going to be so awesome and you're going to meet people and you're going to, you're going to like learn new ideas and you're going to be challenged by people. You're going to be challenged by your professors. You're going to be challenged by your peers. And that is not how college is presented anymore. So it's, it's that shift I think is also very important to understand. So to go ahead and sum this up, then the way they sum up the book is they give three different ways of how to fix this going forward, because I don't know how exactly you fix the the current problem, but going forward, as far as raising children into being adults, you go with obviously making wiser kids, which again, scales back to the idea of allowing more free time, allowing more free play, allowing that gradual transition to adulthood to happen so that they're not just thrown into the deep end and exposing your kids to new experiences, new ideas, and not presenting that as a bad thing, but as a good thing, as a positive, as something that will help you grow as a human being. The second concept being wiser universities, which is, again, going back to the idea of what university was when I was university age and even people older than me to making it be more about the educational experience and about the fact that you are supposed to come here and grow as a person. You're not supposed to graduate here the same person as you were four years ago when you got here. And then also wiser societies, which again is, it goes to that idea of allowing kids to learn how to be adults 
on their own, by themselves, without calling the authorities or calling DFACS or whatever your child protective service is in your particular state, and just basically trying to roll back these ideas of helicopter parenting and safetyism and coddling and trying to get back to a place where it, I mean, I'm sure it seems now that it was so much more dangerous, but honestly, it really wasn't. I mean, we all kind of came out of it okay. And actually as better people than what is currently being produced right now under the current ways of parenting and education and just the way society is treating young people. So on that note, I am going to go ahead and wrap this up. Um, I do highly, highly recommend this book. Please go read it if you're at all interested in trying to understand the current situation with young people and how to potentially fix it going forward, or at least just try to have some understanding of what the hell is going on. So definitely pick it up, read it. And as always, if you did make it this far, thank you for listening. And if you do like this, please rate, comment, and subscribe. You can find me on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. Take care, and until next time.